Welcome to Latina to Latina, a Bustle podcast. I'm your host, Alicia Menendez. This episode, I'm talking to Natalia Oberti Noguera. She's the founder and CEO of Pipeline Angels. My business aha moment was realizing that society has a gendered perspective on how we change the world. When women and femmes say they're going to change the world, the assumption is that they're going to launch a nonprofit. Her mission is to change the world of venture capital and to make sure women and non-binary femme social entrepreneurs get the startup funding they deserve. But her commitment to inclusion goes way beyond the startup world. For Natalia, who self-identifies as a cis, queer Latina, pronouns she and her, it is baked into everything she does. Everything. Natalia, I wish that we had had the mics running when you walked in this room because you gave the most Natalia entrance that I could have possibly imagined, where you walked in and said, I can only be a part of this if you have someone who is black. And you do this type of stuff all the time. I've seen you on panels be like, yo, everyone you just had was white on this panel. Mm-hmm. And it it's such a part of your ethos. I wonder if you even know you're doing it anymore. I enjoy the white tear, so <laughs> I do. <laughs> Well, especially being a non-black Latina, there are tons of issues, you know, like I'm happy to talk about the many marginalized identities I have. You know, I'm queer, I'm a green card holder, and I'm a woman, right? Like a cis woman. And so, you know, when it comes to gender, I wish that like the cis guys would call out sexism. When it comes to racism, I wish that more white people called out racism. When it comes to like homophobia, I wish that more straight people called out homophobia. So when I reached out to you, you were also very clear and very intentional about the fact that if you were going to be a part of it, that you wanted to make sure that I had representation across the board in a number of ways. You wanted to make sure that I had someone who was disabled. You wanted to make sure that I had someone who was Asian and Latina. And I really value that. It does, however, require a comfort with discomfort, right? Walking into rooms and saying something that can, for many people, drop like a bomb. Is that innate for you or did you learn that it was okay to make people uncomfortable if that created the type of change you wanted to create? Wow. And I feel like some people would agree with me with this. I, being me, gives people discomfort. Mm Mm-hmm. I already make people uncomfortable for who I am. Tell me what you mean by that. You know, well, like, especially 2012. My gosh, it's like so long ago, yet so close. Um, Back in the day, pre-repeal of DOMA, one of my jokes that I would say oftentimes would be like, yeah, in the U.S., you know, I might be able to get married in some U.S. states, but not in in all. But guess what? I have double the closet. (laughs) Because I get to borrow things from my partner, who, like, in case people have not put two and two together, is a woman. Just (laughs) putting it out there. Woman of color. So just creating a... And also, I guess, maybe if you put it out, like, another way of thinking of it, I... We moved around quite a bit due to my parents' job. Because your dad worked at the UN, right? Mm, Yes. The first place I ever lived was New Jersey, so we had something in common. Mm -hmm. (laughs) However, it was like a couple of years in Colombia, several years in Honduras, a couple of years in Ecuador, several years in the Dominican Republic. That's where I did my high school. And then I came to Yale. And so moving around, I will say, is, and especially as a kid, where you have to go into a new school, quote unquote, make new friends, et cetera. I really do feel like that taught me being adaptable. And and that's actually a really key skill that now as an entrepreneur, I use each day. The other thing is that each time I moved, in order to kind of like better understand other people, there's a huge part of better understanding oneself. And so my understanding and obviously like unfortunately I got the queer memo like after college I'm like what I missed out why why did it take so long and I think one of the reasons actually it took so long in terms of the memo coming to me is that growing up in Latin America I didn't really have that many role models and as Marian Wright Edelman says you can't be what you can't see and I think a huge part of that is there still needs to be a lot more conversations in the Latinx community about queerness. Well, let's talk about it because you say you didn't get the memo until after college. Did you know and you weren't able to be honest with yourself? Did you know and you weren't able to tell others? That's a great question. I think it was more like when I look back, I'm like, whoa, this is why this is why I felt this way. But because I did not have a frame of reference in terms of what it meant, I couldn't categorize what I was experiencing as this means that you're queer. 
right? <laughs> so in that sense, hindsight is twenty twenty. Like I'm like, oh, I just didn't have the language to describe who I am, right? And so those are the th- sorts of things that like I'm just very aware of. And if I can be part of the solution, if I can be like, you know, there were people who have opened doors for me. And so I think it was like Lorraine Cortez Vasquez. Then she said something like lift while climbing. And I think like that's so beautiful. And of course, let's quote U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama. She had her, I think it was like one of her DNC convention speeches about like when you go through the door, leave the door open so others can come in. Can we talk just a little bit then? Because I do think that this for people who are coming out and especially for Latinos who are coming out. Latinx. Latinx. Mm -hmm. um, Well, we can get to that conversation, (laughs) too. Um, there, there aren't a lot of role models, and it's not something that you can Wikipedia about how somebody else came out. Um, anything you want to share from what you learned from the experience of coming out? And coming out again and again and again. You know, like you're starting to date someone, et cetera, and you want to introduce them to the parents. The closest thing that I had um, living in New York was this older family friend. Her name's Peggy, and she's white. And so the reason that she's special in terms of my own path is um, when I came out to her, she was like, oh, I could have told you that. And I remember being like, uh, why didn't you? <laughs> like, So it was interesting that someone who kind of knew me at that period, you know, as like recent college grad. And in some ways, even though it was like, a, I'll be cheeky and say she like a scoffed, she scoffed, I could have told you that. In some ways, the fact that she scoffed, it was almost like... Um, welcome because it meant like this is who I have been a lot of people still don't get it that it's not a choice it's not a preference this is who I am and I think that that is powerful and for me it's not just so much the journey also it's like the people who have been there along the way and and it reminded me of like this concept in the corporate world that we talk about like sponsor versus mentoring right and so women and femmes tend to be over mentored and not under sponsored. I think it's both Sylvia and Hewlett and Catalyst that have done really interesting research. Can you just like break it down for someone who's listening and doesn't know the difference between having a mentor and having a sponsor? Yes. You know, sponsor someone who even when you're not in the room, they're out there advocating for you, championing and getting something tangible. So, for example, it might be someone who's like, yeah, I'm getting you like that salary raise. I'm getting you that promotion. I'm giving you the special projects that you need to then get to the next level. Mentoring often, you know, is about like not as tangible. You know, the, the research shows are that um, women and femmes, you know, like and especially when they're getting mentored by guys, they'll be told change your tone or you should speak in such a way or like like a lot of behavioral things versus like for the guys being like let's make sure you're on this key task force or let's make sure that you're meeting these people like super so for me the difference is very much about tangible tactical and practical that is I know your point there wasn't even necessarily to critique this but I've never thought about it being problematic in terms of if people feel like they're doing them a favor, but it means that they're also not doing the very tangible things that men are getting. What I find so interesting about what you do with Pipeline Angels, um, the need for a more diverse pool of angel investors, is you found a very specific problem and you created a very pointed solution, right? So people go into these pitch meetings with big ideas, but if everyone sitting at the table says, I'm looking for me, and everyone who's sitting at the table is a white cisgender man, then that doesn't help you if you are a woman of color, if you are so on and so. And so as I understand it, you're doing two different things. You are bringing the idea of angel investment to a more diverse pool of people, empowering them to become angel investors, both, I think, just by spelling out what it is. You need to make $200,000 a year or have, or as a couple, make 300000 And my understanding in terms of why they have these arbitrary numbers is because Um, my lawyer will be happy that I remember to do this PSA. Angel (laughs) investing is high risk. Uh, So, so yes. Side effects include. (laughs) Actually, there are more positive side effects. Like, side effects include you become part of the fight. 
the resistance. So a credit investor, it can either be 200K, which you mentioned, individual income, single person income, or 300K um, for a couple. And so like married. Or and a so, net worth of a million dollars. Correct. A little footnote regarding the 300K that for me, a lot of people don't realize that they're very this might be the word of the day for this episode, practical examples on what it means to like not be inclusive. Before repeal of DOMA, that meant that a couple who's queer might not actually be able to count for the 300K. You know, like, so there, there are actual real implications to getting more voices in the room, right? And to changing policy. And, and for me, that's something that's really really powerful. The way that I got into Pipeline Angels and came up with it was like, I call it reverse market research. In 2008, I had the opportunity to build a network of women social entrepreneurs. I was not as well versed. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, Maya Angelou has a cool quote, which is- You are the only um, person who has as many quotes in your brain as Cory Booker. Oh, really? Yes. I would say, I can't tell if it's number one Cory Booker, number two Natalia, <laughs> or if it's the reverse, but what it's about the two Mary of Jane you. Paul? Like, because she has a lot as number well. Number three. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that show. Okay, so let's give um, my angel a shout out. Um, I didn't know any better. So I didn't do any better. Now that I know better, I do better. And so the reason I'm bringing that up is because back then, you know, I didn't have the language in terms of how to be more gender inclusive. And so the reason I share this also is that I think the more that we can share how we have gotten here, my hope is that that will be helpful, right? And so going back in 2008, I built this network of women social entrepreneurs from about six women to over 1,200 within two years. So it was having conversations with them that I realized how hard it was to raise money. Which companies were the ones that were getting the funding and making the news? Oh, the ones that have white guys, you know, in leadership. And so for me, um, it was really important and it was really obvious that there was this disconnect. And I had my, my business aha moment that I'm going to share with you was realizing that society has a gendered perspective on how we change the world. When women and femmes say they're going to change the world, the assumption is that they're going to launch a nonprofit. When a guy says he's going to change the world, people are not assuming that they're going to launch a nonprofit. Where do you think that comes from, just this idea that women are caretakers or this, I mean, a bias? So if you think about like the free associations people have when you say women and money, they're very different than the free associations people have when they say men and money, right? It's like shark, financier, businessman, VC, all these things. And then oftentimes there'll be like that double standard of like in women money, oh, philanthropists, donors, you, you're saying like volunteers, community service. That stuff is great. But like, why do we have to be bucketed and silo? Like we can also be the other free associations that are often thought of for guys. And so for me, what was interesting was that there are a lot of high net worth women who are making a positive impact with their money through philanthropy. I was like, great, let's create a bridge from philanthropy into angel investing and share with them that they can make a positive impact with their money by investing in women-led, femme-led for-profit social ventures. People often ask, where does Pipeline Angels fit in the funding continuum? And so I often talk about how we talk about bootstrapping, then friends and family round, then angel round, then venture capital round. And Nicole Sanchez, she um, talks about how the tech media glamorizes bootstrapping. And she says, for a lot of our community, bootstrapping is simply called living. The other part that I underscore is that for a lot of entrepreneurs, they might not have the friends and family for the friends and family round. And so our members serve as the friends and family for that round, provide that earlier critical capital injection to get these companies through the pipeline. And so I've started quoting Rihanna, or if you want to be more specific, remixing her. And I'm like, if we want if we want more of us to shine bright like a diamond, we need to invest in diamonds in the rough. And so a really great example is a, a Pipeline Angels portfolio company called Blendor. The um, the founder's name is Stephanie Lampkin. She's a queer black woman. She was on the cover of The Atlantic last year. She won Google Demo last year. Our members invested in her over two years ago. So it took over two years for the status quo to realize the potential that she had. And so that's really where I view that our members are adding value. They're creating this runway that, you know, when people are like, where are the high growth women led, femme led businesses? And I'm like, where's the runway? Well, guess what? We're, cre we, we're creating it at Pipeline Angels because without that runway, yes, sure, we need to create new systems, which is what we're doing. We also need to dismantle the current systems. It doesn't 
always happen overnight. It takes time. And so what can we do while we're working to do, you know, to, to be disruptive and disrupt these systems? We still need to create some support for these entrepreneurs. I want you to teach me to be better. And by that, I mean, I come from television and in television, time is always limited. Um, you're always trying to hit a commercial break. And so some of the language of inclusion becomes really clunky. It's long. It's hard to say. Um, and at the same time, you want people to feel that you're talking to as many people as possible and that you're being as inclusive as possible. And I think there are a lot of people who struggle with the the tension between using the right language um, and communicating effectively and efficiently. How long did it take you? How did you learn to do women and femme, to do... Um, what are some of the other things that you say in yeah. your... Well, I personally prefer saying, for example, women, non-binary people, men of yes. color, right? Or as I, use... or I said, or simply not cis straight white guys, right? Um, if you want to be inclusive, be explicit. I've heard you say in interviews before that one of the, the questions you posit is what would you do if you felt entitled? Which is a very liberating thought provocative question and yet I wonder how does one get there especially in the DT era I feel like that word entitled has come to me like so many other things mm -hmm. like I used to use that because but he doesn't get tired. to have all the words um, but like just to kind of put like a little bit of context behind that it really came at um, and you know there are tons of people and I'll just give us a, a Cindy Gallup shout out because when why not you know that whole idea of like what would a straight white guy do right and Rachel Sklar from the list I learned this other saying from her which was privilege is like oxygen you don't realize it's there until it's gone and so in that that sense if I were to like talk about what being entitled you know in that concept what would you do if you came from a place of abundance right and this is just a simple this is simple like one-on-one -on, -one on reframing instead of talking about like the sucky things and what would you do if you came from a place of abundance okay and so let's use that as the measure so how do you go okay. there how do you come from a place of abundance the first thing that you made me think about is Pipeline Angels member Anna Curran. She uh, has a friend who works in fundraising and she collects no's. That's how she has reframed it. You know, like she's like she needs to get to like like a minimum of 10 no's a day or something like that. And part of like success are the no's. And I think this is actually a great place to premiere something else that I have been thinking about, Alicia. This is really important. What is the saying that really annoys me in the business world? Never take no for an answer. In the business world, there's this kind of like tacit understanding that like that is supposed to be something that is going to inspire people. Never take no for an answer. And so for me, you know, I want to come up with like a different sort of business motto, something like it's OK to get no. You know, it's OK for us to come at it in terms of the business world and say no's are OK. And the goal is not to change that no into a yes. The goal is to find the person who will say yes. Right. It's like it's not focusing on the no's. It's like a no gets you closer to the right. Yes. That's it for now, but we want to hear from you. Email us at Latina to Latina at Bustle com. Send us ideas for awesome guests or whatever it is you're thinking about right now. Remember to subscribe to Latina to Latina on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening. And please leave a review. We love hearing from you. Latina to Latina is produced by Lantigua Williams & Co., mixed by Oluwakemi Aladesui, with assistance from Anna Parsons. Our executive editor is Emily Ann Epstein. Our editorial supervisor is Roseanne Salvatore. And we got to give a special thank you to Jenny Hollander.